He was conscious of the honor and glory, yet he knew that he was going to his ultimate humiliation. That some of those who now shouted his praises would soon be shouting for his death. For he is a man of sorrows, as foretold by the ancient prophet, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Here's chapter 29. The ancient sage, follower of the way, said, He who is conscious of honor and glory, yet keeps to disgrace, returns to pristine simplicity. The way left the city and descended into the valley of the world. Ascending again to the other side of the valley, he came to a garden. Like unto the primordial garden in which his love had once been betrayed. And now the duplicitous one, pretending to return his love, betrays him with a kiss. Now the duplicitous one, pretending to do him reverence, disgraces him in front of all. Love ushers in freedom, but the duplicitous one puts him in shackles. The duplicitous one delivered the simple one to death, and the simple one was brought back into the city. Before, he had entered in honor to be led to final disgrace. Now he enters in disgrace to be held, though, in final honor. He being himself the way on which he trod, the way of return to pristine simplicity. Mm. Good stuff. Here, here's a couple short ones we can grab because I know it's getting kind of long. <clears throat> um, chapter 31. They could have laid hands on him before, but he passed out of their hands many times. Their hour had not yet come then, but now the hour has come. It has come, and the power of darkness. The time has been fulfilled. The work has been accomplished. And now the mind places his beloved word into the hands. The darkness has no power of itself, except it be given by the father of the word and his own time, that out of the most horrible invent in human history, the murder of the creator of life, might come forth the greatest event, the rising of the destroyer of death. Chapter 32, here's another one. He became an outlaw in order to restore the law. He took the sentence of death in order to abolish the sentence of death. Those who condemned him according to the law were themselves condemned by the law. For the only law he gave was love, and that love condemned them. They were judged by love, and he who is love is therefore judge, was judged by them as a transgressor for their transgression. All right. I'm going to move on to the next section just because we're running out of time. So I'm going to find a good one. Here's a good one in the next section. And the next section is titled... Um, the way of quenching desires, the way of quenching desires. And here's chapter 38 in that section. I think this is a pretty good one. The great way, said the ancient sage, is ever without desire. Desire for created things disturbs the original harmony, the primal oneness, the perfect love. Such desire drives from the two, from separation. It chases after its object. It clings to its object. It is anxious and disturbed. Desire for created things equals torment because such desire can never be fully fulfilled. Torment begins when the primal oneness, the perfect love, is broken. Thus, said the ancient sage, embrace simplicity, lessen selfish selfishness, diminish desire. The sage acts without desire, hence he never fails, he never grabs, never loses. He who keeps to the way will not desire to be filled, 
When one is attached to oneself and to the senses, one strives to fill oneself through self-love and sensual pleasure. But the more one strives, the more empty one becomes in order to become full. One must empty oneself. Thus said the ancient sage, quote, In pursuit of learning, every day something is acquired. In pursuit of the way, every day something is dropped. Losing and losing. Till you come to the state of acting without selfish desire. When you act selfishly, nothing is left undone. Ever without desire, the great way empties himself into his creation. Out of love and complete self-giving, he empties himself. Yet being the unchanging cause of all things, he remains ever full. Quenching the desires for created things, followers of the way likewise empty themselves. Out of love and complete giving, for in emptying themselves as he does, they are ever filled with him, and they are ever full. Gosh, I I really did love love the part where uh, where it says, "In pursuit of learning, every day something is acquired; in pursuit of the way, every day something is dropped." Powerful, powerful. As you guys can see, this thing is very interesting and exciting to read. I'm going to move on to the next section just based on our time constraints because I have so many things within the actual text. This, I'm just reading one section in which he sort of re-articulates the Tao Te Ching within a logocentric uh, perspective. So um, that's what I'm reading, reading here. The next section gets us to the way of humility and forgiveness. And so I'll read uh, one from this one. Here, here, here's a good one. <clears throat> yeah. This one's from chapter 48, the way of humility and forgiveness in this section. And it reads, the way said the ancient sage, quote, covers its cutting edge. It transcends entanglement, softens its light, merges with dust, unquote. True humility cannot be defined in words, for it is the raiment of the primal essence himself. The way of heaven clothed himself in it. Descending from his loftiness, he used it to hide his splendor, lest his creation be consumed by the fiery vision. Creation could not look directly upon his uncreated light nor could it hear the voice of his thunders. Therefore he descended not in an earthquake, nor in a fire, nor in a terrible and mighty sound, but, as the ancient prophet, like rain upon a fleece, like raindrops falling upon the earth, softly, concealing himself in the veil of his flesh, speaking with us in the body, wrought in the womb of the maiden, abasement, said the ancient sage, as the foundation of exaltation. Loftiness is based in lowliness. Hence the sage wears coarse garments but embraces the jewels in his bosom. Everyone who puts on the coarse garment of humility is like unto the way who puts it on before us. When, through his wearing the coarse body of our lowliness, Creation beheld his loftiness and at last received its jewel, the vision of its maker. Pretty good stuff there. Um, here is, I'll just skip to the next section. Uh, So the next section is titled The Way of Suffering. And here, here's a good one. Chapter 64. So ch chapter 64, this is on the way of suffering. Desire for created things combined with the senses becomes pleasure. The senses stimulated by desire 
take advantage of the sensible object. Sensual pleasure is the mother of division, breaking the primal oneness, the perfect love. Sensual pleasure is the mother of death, and the death of such pleasure is suffering. In desiring to escape pain, we seek refuge in sensual pleasure, calling it by the name of happiness. But in trying to blunt pain with pleasure, we but increase our pain, for pleasure and pain are intertwined. Therefore did the ancient sage cry, O misery, happiness lies by its side. O happiness, misery lurks beneath it. Wherever there is pleasure, there must be pain. There must be pain. For through pain we have not chosen. The way turns us from illusory pleasure that we have chosen. Pain forces us to rise above the realm of the senses, to live according to our true nature, our original designation. There are two kinds of pain. Pain of the senses an absence of the object of the body's desire, and a pain of the soul, an absence of the object of the soul's desire. Pleasure of the senses is emptiness ever filling itself, yet remaining ever empty. Pleasure of the soul is fullness ever emptying itself, yet remaining ever full. Therefore, said the ancient sage, What is most full seems to be empty, but in its use cannot be exhausted. Mmm. Dang! That is so good! I love these. Gosh! Um, Here's in the next session, it's following the way of truth, which I like. Here's one that I, I, I really enjoyed in following the way of truth. The essence of the way, said the ancient sage, is supremely true. Within is the evidence. From the beginning until now, its name has remained, and it contains all truth. A two-faced person, one who is one thing outwardly and another inwardly. Such a one not only lies, but makes his very life a lie. Guile and duplicity sap one's power, engendering cowardice and fear. But the honest and true person, one who is the same outwardly and inwardly, remains unconfused, and thus has boldness without fear. When the way returns, he will come with boldness and with power, and there is no falsehood to be found in him. He has boldness because he is one, He has power because he is not double. He is unconquerable because he cannot be divided. His eye is single. And the light of his eye fills the whole of his body of his unique eternal being. Holy, single, simple, and unconfused. He is therefore wholly true. And not only true, nor yet the embodiment of truth, but truth itself. For he said, I am truth. Unquote. Yeah. There's another one I liked. I think it was... The way is not found by those who seek after signs, although he may give signs. The way is not found by those who seek after wonders, though he may manifest wonders. The way is not found among those who seek after communion with spirits, although he alone is pure spirit and adored by all spirits. Those who seek after signs may behold false signs. Those who seek after wonders may be deceived by lying wonders. Those who seek after communion with spirits may come into contact with dark spirits hiding under the guise of light. The way is not found by these seekers, but by those who, 
whether they seek or not, are irresistibly drawn to what is wise and true, to what is simple and pure, to what is childlike, to what is lowly, and sadly, sadly, what is beautiful.